if we casually say, oh, never mind. Next life I do this, next life I do this, next life I do this. You don't even know what's gonna happen to you tomorrow. You're not even sure what's gonna happen to you next year. Then how do you know what's gonna happen to you in your next life? So if we casually throw spiritual practice aside, if we casually throw spiritual commitments aside, and we just make it a joke, we make it fun, never mind, next year, next month, next day, next week, then we'll be in for a very, very abrupt and rude awakening. Why? As I repeat, as I said, if we don't even know what we're going to do tomorrow, what will happen to us? A car accident? Sickness? Sudden death? Even as we sit right now, some of us are ticking health time bombs in our body. Ticking away. Ticking means what? It's an insinuation that it will come to an end. Our bodies will come to an end. Even this very moment we're sitting here, we are ticking, walking, health time bombs. That any moment from stress, from karma, from accident, from the disease arising, or one of the um, uh, four elements going off, that something will come out that will disturb our life or create death. Any moment. Any moment. This last year, almost every two to three months, one of my friends or one of their friends died. Every two to three months, there was a funeral this past year. Past year doesn't mean the calendar 2006 to 2007. I'm talking about the last 12 months. There's been a death. One day soon, we're even going to say in this room, hey, who died? Oh my God, we need to do prayers. Oh, we need to go to so-and-so's funeral. Why are we an exception? One day soon, we're even going to say, who has died in this group? Who is not here anymore? Who cannot attend anymore? Who cannot be here anymore? One day soon, we're going to hear that. When, that. when that time is approaching, what do you think is most important? To put our spiritual practice aside, then we say, but my wife is very important. My wife is very important. My wife is very important. My husband, my kids, my friends. We always use that as an excuse to say that's very important. But actually, that type of person is not bad. They're ignorant. Why? You're not helping your wife by only focusing on material help, love, and gains. Why? Because when your wife and your husband and your kids, or after you've gone, nothing can help them. Or when they're dying and they're going, nothing can help them. You see, I have to do funerals quite often. And I go and talk to the families. I'm talking to you from experience. I'm talking to you from when they close the door and they tell me what their fears are. I have to often in the past go see people who are dying or who are on near death. And I listen to their fears and I listen to what they say. And I tell you, they usually say, I'm afraid what will happen to me after I've died. Usually. And this is not Chinese or Malaysian. This is everywhere in the world. I even have people emailing me. They're terminally ill, terminally sick. They have six months to one year. What can they do with themselves now? The difference between them and us is they know. We don't know. But we can go before them. So we use job and making money and family and kids as an excuse to delay our Dharma practice. It's a valid excuse for people who are our level, who only think that. But it wouldn't be a valid excuse for the ultimate truth from people who have wisdom and who know more. Why? Because at the time of death, all these things that you treasure so much and you love so much and you're attached to will not be able to help you. How much do we work toward keeping our husband? How much effort and body and sacrifice and time and energy and thinking and money we put toward keeping our husband, keeping our wife? But in the end, they will have to be abandoned. So. What is the purpose here? The purpose or goal here is, why don't we make it, strike a balance? Why don't we strike a balance? If we really love our wife, if we really love our kids, if we really love the people that we claim we love, we have to help them beyond this life. And the only way to help them beyond this life is if we have some attainments and we can dedicate our practice and merits back to them. If we can dedicate our merits back to them, or we have practice that can teach them a better method, it will help them. If we do spiritual practice, do you know how much that will influence our wives, our husbands, our friends, our kids? You know, our kids are watching us. Our kids are growing up. 
How do you know that? Think when you were younger. All the things you observed that your parents did. Good and inverted commas bad. And when you grow older, you're able to think. You respect them, but you also know that they're humans when they grow up. But when you were kids, they were devas or titans to you. Everything they do is without mistake. But when you grow up, you can see reality. My point is what is? When you go, this life you have spent so much time and energy and money investment for your kids. If they don't have the karma, according to Lord Buddha, to enjoy, to receive, to keep, or to have, when you're gone and you can't protect them, they're finished. There are many, many kids that I have met from wealthy families that end up very, very bad situations. Very, very bad. There are many people I've met that children from very poverty-stricken backgrounds with respect to them end up very good due to attitude and vice versa. Rich to good, also bad, poor to bad, many types. My point is what? Is whether our kids fare well or not is not dependent totally on what we give them, such as education or money. It is example, the example of our Dharma practice. If we do Dharma practice, if we put Dharma practice in our mind and we show priority to our Dharma practice, that will be the message we send our kids. Don't think, oh, they're too young, or they don't know, or they don't understand. They're not stupid. Everything is registered. And when we leave behind, when we are dead, and we really love our kids, if we really, really love our kids, we will leave Dharma practice behind, along with money or education, whatever we like to. But why? If we give them Dharma practice, they will have a method to be happy and they will know how to protect themselves, and they will know how to think and function and act and be good human citizens. If we only think about money and material things and food and taking care of them, what's the point? Animals can do that. If we look at ourselves, we're becoming wrinkled. We're becoming drained, dried. All this is going to our kids. All this is going to our kids. We lose our bodies. We destroy our health. All for kids. And then we like to romanticize that by saying, oh, you know, but I love my kids. I like this. Yeah, your neighbors might say yes who don't know any better than you. But the truth of the matter is your attachments create even more suffering and problems. In Buddhism, if you want to go to the highest level of thought, kids and family is not something to be very proud of. It's not something to advertise. It's not something to say, wow, it is an extension of your sexual desire, your lust, your greed, your attachments, to me. If I have kids, it will further my lineage. If I have a wife, I will have company, I will have sex, I'll have fun, I'll have whatever. If I have a husband, I'll have security, I'll have whatever. Actually, in higher Buddhist thought, where people are ready, these types of things such as business, it's an extension of greed. Wives and husbands, it's an extension of one's grasping ego, thinking, Having these will bring security. Kids are open advertisement of our lust and our desire. And to use job, kids, business, family as an excuse not to do Dharma practice to normal people who don't understand anything. They'll say, yeah, that's a very valid reason. But if you think about it in a higher way with wisdom, it is actually a shame. Why is it a shame? I have family commitments. I can't do Dharma. I can't get involved. I can't help. I have to make money so I can't do Dharma. I can't practice, I can't meditate, I can't get involved. I have kids, therefore I can't do it. Actually, it's a shame. Why? You may be saying it to the other person, but you're reinforcing something in you, which is the ego. Those are not things to be proud of. If they were to be proud of, Mother Teresa and His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Lord Buddha and Jesus would all have families and kids. They would all focused on them. Why do we look at them as examples, but we practice the opposite or think the opposite? So my point is what? If we have kids, okay, that's the result of our karma. We have it. So do we abandon them? No, of course not. Of course not, no. But we need to already divide our time to what is important. And we need to be realistic. And we need to be de deciding those decisions based on wisdom and knowledge, not on hearsay, samsara, culture, or upbringing, or habituations. We cannot base it on that. So therefore, Having kids and using that as an excuse not to do Dharma practice is contrary to what the Buddha has taught. Why? 
You're saying, because of this desire and this result, result I'm not going to do it. In fact, your kids take you away from Buddhahood. Your kids take you away from practice and dharma. Takes you away from freedom and health and pursuit of spiritual development. It takes you away. The reality is that your jobs do the same thing. Your wife does the same thing. Your husband does the same thing. Your relationship does the same thing. Your business does the same thing. Everything does the same thing. Why? Because when you are dying, you won't even be able to feel the person touching you anymore. When the earth element in you dissolves, even the, most, the person you have slept with and lived and ate with your whole life, your mother, your beautiful mother, your beautiful father, your, your children, your wife, your husband, whoever those people are, even when they touch you, you won't be able to feel it. Medically, that's correct. According to meditation, that's correct. You won't even be able to feel it. And you will start losing sight. When the wind element goes, you will start losing your hearing. Even when they talk to you, you won't be able to hear. You won't be able to see. And then you will feel cold when your fire element goes. And when your water element goes, thirst, vision goes, the vision dries, thirst goes, I'm sorry, thirst comes, feeling of sinking. All these feelings will come to you in a process of death. All these feelings. And none of the, per, nobody in this room is an exception. Whether you're a high lama sitting on the throne with that label that you're a high lama sitting on the throne, or you have a label you're not a high lama sitting on a chair or the floor. That's just a label. It will happen to every single person in this room. And when that happens and you look back at your life, what did you do? What is the sum of your life? A few kids? Some thousands of dollars in the bank? An inheritance? You had a wife? You had a husband? You had a nice house? Is that the sum of your life? Is that what you want to leave behind? Is that what you want to leave behind for them and yourselves? Is that criticism? No. I say all of this to all of you with the deepest respect. I'm a Dharma teacher. I have to teach the Dharma. Even if what I explain to you goes against your conventional thoughts. If I'm afraid to speak this, it would mean that I'm very selfish. It means that I am not teaching Dharma, that I'm actually just trying to make friends with you. So I don't say any of these things to disrespect any of you or what you have done or to criticize or to point fingers. No, 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 no. I'm a Dharma teacher. That's my job. That is my job. To tell you the truth with respect, clearly, logically, with the deepest hope that something will go in and activate some karma we have received from praying or meditating in this life and previous lives so that we can make a change before it's too late. That is my job. Dharma teachers become the most unpopular people. You think they become popular people. No, they become the most unpopular people because they tell people what they don't want to hear. Dharma teachers get threatened. I've got threatened many times, physically threatened. Dharma teachers get a lot of obstacles traveling. Dharma teachers have a lot of trouble starting things, getting help. Dharma teachers have a lot of obstacles convincing and Dharma teachers make the most enemies. Why? Because they tell people the truth. And sometimes, sometimes it takes time for people to absorb the truth. And they do many, many different types of avoidance techniques to not hear and listen because it's very painful. So therefore, instead of attacking the pain at the source, they attack the Dharma teacher. Verbally, threats, or saying that is not good, or the lineage is wrong, or what they're teaching is not applicable, they do many, many. Some even avoid Dharma teachers, or avoid the Dharma center, say I don't want to go. Or some don't want to go and not listen, and rather stay home, watch TV. Why? What they listen to is very painful. I'm not here to create pain. I'm not here to create pain. If you're sick and you go to the doctor, and he touches your body parts, and he takes tests and pokes you with needles, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt because that pain will go away from he with healing applied. So therefore, in Dharma teachings, it's quite painful. Why? It touches something even more sensitive than our bodies, our mind. So the point of what I'm saying is motivational. The amount of time that we spend for actual happiness, 
and the creation of happiness through positive karma. The actual time we spend to actually dedicate to the people we love. The actual time that we spend to actually bring benefit to others that we love. It's maybe an hour a day. It's maybe an hour a day. Maybe two hours. Some of us like to meditate three, four hours. But we can check our meditation. Meditation is not sitting on a cushion and feeling great bliss and happiness and your focus. Meditation is that you gain the abilities to be of more benefit to others and your attachment to work, to money, to sex, to fun, to entertainment becomes less and less and less and less and less and your spiritual practice becomes more. That is the object of meditation. What else can it be? Proof, Lord Buddha. As he meditated more and more, what level did he reach? Did he have more wives? Did he give up the Bodhi tree and go back to his wife? Proof is Lord Buddha. The aim of meditation. That is a real aim. So what happens is this is, even some people, when you even talk to them about meditation, they have resistance. Why? It's very scary for them to focus within. They're very used to looking for distractions without, outside. 